How are you guys doing tonight? I think we're on time, so that's a good thing. And I have to put my glasses on because I can't read anymore. That's what happens when you're in Bethlehem too long. Um, on behalf of the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce and the Spotlight, I'd like to welcome you to our candidate forum tonight. I'm John McIntyre, publisher of the Spotlight, and I'll be the moderator of tonight's event. We have invited the candidates that are running for the office of Bethlehem Town Board this year to have an exchange of ideas. Our goal is to provide the voters with information so they can make educated choice on November 6th. So there's a few things that we request from the audience. We have, number one, we have many topics in only 90 minutes. So we ask that you refrain from applause until we're done with the forum, until we're done asking the questions. Please, no candidate signs or literature that will distract any of the things going on here in this venue. Um, no demonstrations for or against any candidate. No recording of this forum except for approved media, and we will provide a link of the entire thing here tonight um, on spotlightnews.com. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. It's always fun to hear all those ring. Um, after closing statements, I've asked the candidates to stay for a meet and greet session in this room. So if you have to, if you get a chance, make sure you introduce yourself, say hello. You can ask them all sorts of questions that maybe you didn't hear tonight and, you know, really get them cornered. So, all right, let me take a few minutes to explain our format tonight um, before I introduce our candidates. The candidates will have three minutes for an opening statement. The order of opening and closing statements uh, was determined a few minutes ago by a coin flip. Um, after the opening statements, the order will then carry through for the questions and will be the same, same order as it was for the closing statement. So the opening and the closing will have the same order. The reason why is the person who gets, gets the first and then somebody gets the last. Somebody gets the first word and the last word. So the questions um, were generated by the Spotlight staff and will be asked tonight by Spotlight News Managing Editor Michael Hallisey, who is sitting right here. All questions will be topical in nature and are posed to both candidates. The candidates received categories and a general summary of the topic being asked in advance of this um, just so that they could prepare. But we didn't send them the actual questions. <laughs> it's always great, right? So anyway, each candidate will have two minutes to address each question and then each have a minute to rebut if they wish. Also, each candidate will receive two red cards. They have two cards there with X's on them, and they can add one minute to any response. The red cards can't be used during the opening and closing statements. Caitlin and Teresa, raise your hands. Uh, they will be the timers, and they will notify the candidates when they are close on time and when time's up. If you exceed the time too much, I'll cut you off. I'll unplug your mic. I'm only kidding. So, as you can, as you can see, the format's going to leave lots of time to address each question. And again, the, the, the entire forum is being recorded, and a link will be posted on Spotlight News by tomorrow evening, I hope. As long as we can get all the technology to work, I hope. Now, for the introductions. On my right is Jim Carriero. He will appear on the Republican, Conservative, and Independent lines. And on my left is Dan Coffey. He will appear on the Democratic, Working Families, and women's equality lines. Mr. Coffey will go first in the opening and closing statements. Mr. Carriero will get the last word. Mr. Coffey. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you to the Spotlight, and thank you to the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce, uh, and thank all of you uh, for coming tonight. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Jim uh, for participating in this event. We're going to talk about local issues tonight, but I just want to start by talking about some of the things that's been happening nationally and how that affects us locally. We've seen acts of terrorism last week where we've seen bombs sent to uh, people's mailboxes, and we also saw people uh, in Pittsburgh um, who were uh, shot for their religious beliefs. What I find and what I'm heartened about walking our community, and I've, I've hit on thousands of doors of this campaign season and last, is that Bethlehem is a, a very tolerant and uh, very civil 
uh, community. And I mean that um, for all political persuasions, Republican, Democratic, or independent. And I'm glad that we're able to come here tonight and have a civil, respectful uh, forum where we can talk about uh, the issues. Um, this is a special election to fill the last remaining year on Supervisor Van Leuven's term uh, because he was elected to the town board and Giles Wagner has uh, been filling that seat this year. Like many of you, um, I, uh, I did not grow up in Bethlehem. Jim grew up in Connecticut. I grew up, grew up in Plattsburgh. Uh, my wife grew up in Glens Falls. And what attracted me and a lot of you to come to our town and to locate here is all the great services that we have. We have top rated schools. We have a fabulous library. We have a great park system. Now we have a farmer's market. We have a rail trail. And that's why you and a lot of us moved our families here. People are happy, uh, but people have some concerns that in the future we're going to lose some of our community character. They see some of the development coming into town, and they feel that something needs to be done to try to rein in development and try to preserve open space. And that's the number one issue uh, that I'm running on. I feel like I have the background and experience to deal with the issues of uh, uh, preserving open space and um, trying to uh, rein in development. You cannot stop all development. It's illegal to just pass a law that says we're not going to develop everything, but you certainly can guide it better. Um, and um, in my opinion, one of the top priorities is we need an open space preservation fund. Our comprehensive plan came out in 2005. The town has just started the process of updating it. And so we need to go the full comprehensive plan review and we need to set up a funding source for an open space preservation fund. I want to do more to try to um, have people use our Hudson River waterfront. I want to do more to attract business to Vista Tech Park, to the industrial zoned areas. I want to explore uh, setting up a bypass uh, so that we don't have truck traffic traveling through Selkirk. Um, I want to develop more um, services and restrooms along the rail trail. Um, and I'd like to, to um, see if we can do more to realize cost savings by partnering with other communities in the county to have more shared services um, to um, continue to have our tax increases well within the tax cap. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Coffey. Mr. Carriero? Okay, good evening. It's unlike me to be quiet, so I was a little bit surprised at that. But um, first of all, thank you all for joining us this evening. It's an indication to us that um, some of you do care. Uh, when you're going door to door, I have to tell you it's a little lonely because often people don't answer the door to chat. So it's exciting to see how much of us are patriots in the end. Um, to the Spotlight in the Chamber of Commerce, thank you for this event this evening. I want to tell you that the Spotlight has been absolutely phenomenal, cooperative, um, and I have a greater appreciation for free press when you need to have debates and discussions with a, a civil tone to them. Um, I am deeply concerned about the nature of what we saw the past two weeks um, with bomb scares and people being shot as they prayed. This is bizarre. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we hold on to the values that we are people that can talk to each other, have disagreements, and have civil discourse. But more importantly, that there's a representation of all sides to issues and that even the minority gets to be heard here so that they don't grow discontent and angry with our form of government. Um, the most important part of this evening is the exchange of ideas. And although on many issues, Mr. Coffey and I both agree, and I find him to be a very gracious, reasonable human being, there are different ways that we may be able to accomplish the same things. So in my career and my experience, it is bringing people together from diverse opinions, having debate, dealing with the issues that may be causing conflict, and finding resolutions. So if you find that I tend to be a, a mediator, a person that wants to find the center and bring sides together, then that's true. If you want dramatic outbursts of anger and fury, that's not me. But I will assure you that I will debate and defend the minority 
as well as I will debate and defend the majority so that all sides are heard clearly and that we come to fair judgments that are, that are reasonable to both sides. Thank you. Okay, great. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Hallisey and we'll start with the questions. Gentlemen, thank you very much. A house divided cannot stand. Explain your approach to working with people you disagree with on policy issues and how do you find common ground to best govern? Mr. Coffey? Oh, I started off tonight to talk about civility, and civility is not a Republican or Democratic value. I do believe it's a, a Bethlehem value. Um, I served uh, in, this, in this room on the planning board for one year and on the zoning board for seven years. We did not always agree with each other. Sometimes we had very strongly held opinions. Sometimes the vote were three to two and I was in the, in the majority, sometimes it was three to two and I was in the minority, but we were always very respectful and we always listened to each other um, and we were always civil towards each other. Um, my um, philosophy towards governance is you have to get all the facts, you have to let the data drive the policy and you cannot let emotion drive the policy. Sometimes the loudest voices in the room are not the ones to listen to, but you want to listen to the majority opinion and listen to all opinions. Always listen to both sides of, of every issue uh, before you m make up your decision. That's the way I did it when I was in the zoning board and planning board, and that's how I would approach it as a town board member. Thank you, Mr. Carrier. Consensus building in different circumstances requires different talents, but essentially, you have to have good communications with people. Um, because I really like people, I find it easy to question them about where they are and where they're coming from. In business, conflict is constant. Um, whether you're reviewing a loan or you're reviewing a request of a government or um, of a school district to provide a certain service or provide funding for their programs, conflict is constant. Resolution, though, takes talented people. Um, bringing people together in teams to work together in the private enterprise environment is extremely difficult because everyone is very strong-willed. So I had to become better talented at working with people and getting their opinions out on the table first in order to build teams, in order to build good results. In the public sector, though, you have a, a, a more challenging environment, and that is the voter. And so the way to deal with that is to go to them and have constant contact with them and get their feedback and direction. In doing that, you begin to develop opinions. Working with boards requires that you take that input and talent of working with people and understanding them and their agendas, the diversity of it, and bringing that to the board to draw conclusions from. Thank you. Do you have a one minute? Just one minute. Just obviously Jim and I agree on most of this. Um, the important thing, as we both emphasize, is to um, be able to listen to everybody, be respectful, not keep it personal. And at some days when you're going to disagree, you can disagree civilly because the next day you may agree on something. Um, try not to govern from a philosophical standpoint, but just govern from a fact-based uh, standpoint when trying to do the best policy. I've worked for large law firms. I've worked for small law firms. I manage a two-person law firm right now. So I've had different environments. I've also worked for the federal government. I've worked in local government, and I've worked in the private sector. So I've had a variety of opportunities to work with a variety of, of, uh, of people in different situations. Thank you, sir. The next question goes to rebuttal. Another rebuttal? Yeah. So let me give you an example of where there's real intense conflict in a community. In Grafton, Mass., we had a water system that was being managed by a private company. Um, the system was just slowly turning into a disaster for the community. And we decided, a group of us, that we had to bring the water district from a private corporation to a public entity. And who do you think had to convince the community that it had cash flow, that it had a 40-year payback, that it could make money for us, and we can reinvest in it? I had to do that. And I had to do it with the confidence of knowing the numbers I was giving these people, the voters, that they would hold up. So the other night, I woke up at 3 in the morning and said, oh my god, did the Grafton Water District work? Because now it's been 20, 30 years. 
So I went online and I got their financial performance. And by the good grace of God and my training and education, it worked. I didn't do it alone. It took a group of us and we had to convince the voters of this. Thank you. Okay. Now next question. My apologies before. The next question goes to Mr. Carriero. Since both of you are not currently on the town board, you both have an outside perspective. What areas is the current town board governing in a successful way and or what concerns do you plan to address? I, I tend to believe that boards um, have a, an, a very difficult time focusing on issues and doing a lot of detailed analysis of it. Um, what I see happening on our town board is that they take an awful lot of direction um, from the supervisor. And there seems to be a lack of debate and confrontation about the issues that face us. That concerns me. The things that are working are that they are very cooperative together, but I almost get a sense that the decisions were made before they came to the meeting. Um, I think there needs to be more of an open debate forum and challenging of authority so that we are ensured as citizens that this was thoughtfully uh, executed, their policies and their procedures. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey. Um, the areas in which I think the town is doing a, a great job, I would, I would first of all start with budgeting. Uh, the town uh, has consistently been under the tax cap, has never had opportunity to go above the tax cap. We see in Colony, e, they're talking about going up to 5% and having to exceed the tax cap. We've, they've consistently done a good job giving high quality services uh, with minimal tax increases. Only about 11 or 12 cents of every one of your tax dollars goes to the town, and the town does a phenomenal amount with that. Uh, we have a five-year capital plan to address some of our long-term concerns, such as infrastructure, sewers, sidewalks. Um, uh, but we're, so we, um, we're one of the only, I think we're the only municipality in the area that actually does that, a five-year capital plan, and we need to continue that. Um, the area where I believe we need to move forward on is the Open Space Preservation Fund, which was one of the recommendations in the 2005 Comprehensive Plan. We've seen more and more development come in. We see the situation with Clanky Farms, uh, where unfortunately uh, one of the titled owners wants to have it developed, and there really isn't much the town can do about it. If we have an open space fund, uh, we could buy up development rights or buy the property. Same thing with Slingons, where they're trying to cram 24, 25 apartments uh, next to the historic vault. If we had an open space fund, there's more that we could do uh, to, to preserve open space. Thank you, sir. Rebuttal? The, uh, the reality is we have a great finance team in this town. Um, Michael and I have worked together in the past when I was in the private sector. Um, phenomenal, good skills. Uh, and having said that, I think they give a lot of direction and discipline to our town government. Um, clearly the board, though, does not have a lot of expertise in the area of finance. And I see that as a, a group of people that has a great deal of trust in what they are given as information and direction. I think that has led us to some difficult and inappropriate decisions. Um, as strong as Michael is, the reality is, as the controller, the board needs to have more insight and intervention in the policies that are set. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey, rebuttal. Um, again, there's a thing called the fiscal stress test, which is an independent uh, gauge, and year after year, Bethlehem gets, a, I believe it's a zero on the fiscal stress test. So uh, we have one of the highest uh, uh, ranking um, in terms of uh, how, we, how we budget and all that. So I have no concerns with the budget um, and the job that they're doing, providing quality services while keeping your tax increases low. The other thing I think we need to do more of is to try to fill Vista Tech Park with tech or something else, but try to bring in more business to try uh, so we're not as reliant on property taxes that residences pay. Thank you, sir. Next question is directed first to Mr. Coffey. What skills from your profession, Mr. Coffey, as an attorney, do you feel would best benefit the town? Uh, thank you. Just to give a little biographical information, so I, I am an attorney. Um, I also have a master's in public administration uh, in addition to a political science degree. 
Um, I have worked as an attorney since 1990. It's hard to believe it's that long, but um, as I said, I've worked, I've, I've worked in environmental um, law, I've worked in land use and planning, I've worked as a litigator, um, and I think being able to deal uh, with uh, clients, being able to manage a budget, um, and I think when we're trying to attract new buses to the town, just um, having um, experience in the private sector as well as working with government um, is important. And I think overall, when you're a litigator, and I know we have uh, Jim Foster's on the town board is also an attorney, um, having the skills of dealing with legislation, drafting legislation, interpreting legislation, and occasionally we're going to get into some legal snafus where we have to make decisions um, that involve reviewing case law and discussing with our town attorney, uh, Jim Potter. So I think having, having that background would, would serve well on the town board. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Cario. So let's look at some of the things in our budget for a moment. I didn't realize until I went to the recent budget session for the town that we're paying $1.7 million a year to buy water. Now, as I travel throughout this community, I heard many people say to me, our water bills are outrageous. Well, I think I discovered why. We bought a $10 million treatment plant that we're paying for. We're paying $1.7 million a year to the city of Albany to buy water. I think we might be better served to have bought a battleship, taken water off of the Atlantic Ocean, and recycled it than to have paid these kind of dollars for water. We're into this contract for $25 million plus a $10 million plant. I'm not sure that was the best solution. If it was, no one has proven that to me. And having the fiscal ability to analyze and cash flow a project, not just for this year or five years, but for 25 or 30 years is a strength. Having to deal with conflict in this process is you need to look at the long term and the impact of these contracts. $35 million in 15 years for water is a lot of money. So maybe we're fiscally appropriate in how we allocate it and pay for it, but you're paying for it. And I'm suggesting to you there might have been other ways to do this, that if we looked at it as a $35 million investment, with another five years to go, we might have thought differently of that. So fiscal prudence, you can fit the numbers into the categories if you have the ability to tax. Are they logical? Not necessarily. And that's what talent I would bring to the table. Having counseled governments and set debt for them and have, having to present that to voters to convince them is a, an experience I've had, and it worked. As a banker, I had to counsel them on the right way to do these things and what not to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey, rebuttal. Um, sure. The, again, the question was about background experience. I do have some, some thoughts about water, but we'll save that I, because I assume that's going to be a future question. Um, I've had a chance to deal with budgets, both as uh, running my law practice, but also I was privileged enough to be the president of the Bar Association, also treasurer of it, and we had to review balance sheets, we had to re review income statements every month, and we had to balance our books, and we had a structural deficit when I uh, started as president of the Bar Association, we had to make some difficult decisions, we were able to balance our budget, so I feel I, I bring, uh, and I also worked a long time ago for the Congressional Budget Office and the General Accounting Office in Washington, so I do feel I bring some public sector budgeting skills uh, to the position. Thank you. And Mr. Carriero. So budgeting in a bank is truly a nightmare. Um, customarily, what they ask you to do is double your production, cut your overhead, and um, meet a significant increase in revenue. So I had to discover the process of convincing people within our teams that we could hit these goals. And the way that was accomplished was by having them have input into the process and actually coming up with the solutions. Secondly, um, you, having done that for 35 years in a bank, one has to realize that you're going to have to give up certain things and accomplish them. It's not just the budget, it's how you do it. Finally, um, serving on three foundation boards, serving governments as a treasurer of a water district and on a school board, budgets were a constant experience and maintaining them and staying within them was very challenging, but I've had that experience. Thank you, sir. Next question is directed to Mr. Carriero. What board committees would you hope to be tasked with as a board member and why? Well, 
I would actually have to leave that to the experience of, uh, upon arrival, evaluating what those boards were and where I fit in best. And I'd actually want the input of the, uh, the town supervisors, their recommend, his recommendation, um, and to those around me that were fiscally part of the process. Um, most importantly though, I think we have had a dramatic miss here of our uh, ecological um, uh, foundation of our community. Conservation has suffered drastically here and it's under the hands of 15 years of a one party system has, that has led us to believe that our economy is being taken care of and our ecology. And I'm gonna suggest to you, I would rear an ugly hand over that process. I don't think it has worked. I think we are stressed and we're growing at a, a maximum speed and we don't have the infrastructure to support that. So clearly something with the environment is where I'd wanna be involved in the process. Secondly, in terms of taxation, I think there has to be a real reevaluation of what occurred here five years ago and the reassessment of our community. The damage done to our private landowners, our farmers, and even the small plots of land within Del Mar has been dramatic. It has caused irreparable damage to our society and to our community and has caused growth to go off the charts. Bethlehem should not be for sale. Thank you, sir. Rebuttal, Mr. Coffey? Thanks. Or or no, this is my, yeah. This is my understanding, uh, your question, Mike, it was pertaining to the, what board committees I'd want to serve on. I mean, in a town like Bethlehem, a um, uh, five-member board, we only have, we have 35,000 residents, and you've got five elected officials, so I think you have to kind of be a, a jack of all trades. But in terms of what I particularly have an interest in, it would be the budget and also um, land use, comprehensive plan, and open space issues. The town has started the process of revising the comp plan, uh, but I would be happy to take the lead on that um, as to how we can uh, address development, update the comprehensive plan and our zoning laws, um, how we can slow and better manage the growth that's happening in our town, and how we can take more proactive steps to preserve open space. Um, in terms of what Jim is proposing about the reassessment from five years ago, there was a look at what property owners were paying. The vast majority of residents in town um, saw a tax decrease. Um, I'm assuming most of you, show of how many of you own less than an acre of land in town? I'm assuming most people in town own less than an acre, as do I. I think what Jim's proposing is give a tax break to the large landowners, which would mean everybody in this room that owns less than an acre would have their taxes go up. I'm not in favor of that. I think everyone should be taxed fairly and that we should have programs like the conservation easement program in place so that when people are stressed, if they sign a pledge that they are not gonna develop their land, we will give them a tax break. And farmers have, uh, if they have more than seven acres, there's a farmland exemption which is available to farmers uh, where they get an 80% tax break. So yes, we need to preserve open space, but we can't just simply give large landowners a tax break because that would cause everyone else's taxes to increase. Thank you, sir. Rebuttal? So I, I'm not at all suggesting that the tax burden be shifted back to the homeowner. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is, is that if we believed in conservation, we would not have raised the taxes on those private lands and farms as dramatically as we did. Moderation is not a bad thing. We went too far. We're now living with the impact of that in our society. Walk out your door and look at the property that's being developed. I can't get up in the morning without hearing trees falling in the short distance from me. That's a shocking reality that taxation had an impact on us to this degree. We would not be in this fix had we been more moderate in our approach to increasing taxes. It was unnecessary to go to this dramatic step. Now the question is what was used, what was done with the money that was used? And I'm gonna get into that further, but I think the priorities were inappropriate. Go look at the, the station that's being built on uh, Adams Street, please. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Coffey. Um, again, I'm not here to litigate the past. I'm not here to say whether the process of reassessment uh, should have been phased in over time or not. All I can say is if I'm elected going forward, what would I propose? And I do not propose reversing the clock and giving tax breaks to large landowners because the only way to pay for it would be to raise everyone else's taxes 
or to bust through uh, the tax cap, and that's not something I'm prepared to do. Yes, we need to preserve open space, which is why I'm running, and that's one of the top issues I'm running on. We need an open space preservation fund, which we don't have. We've seen it happen in Clifton Park and other communities where developers want to take over, and the town can buy up development rights or give a tax break to landowners so they don't develop their land. Those are the proactive um, things that I suggest we move forward on. Thank you very much, sir. The next question is directed to Mr. Coffey. The town is currently looking to place Delaware Avenue on a road diet. What are your thoughts on the subject? Um, the, uh, the complete streets program, as it's, it's I guess, more formally called, uh, was something that was, uh, again, referred to in the comprehensive plan. We've seen the section of Delaware Avenue that we're on currently is single lane in both directions, um, and the improvements that were made on Delaware Avenue, while it was painful while we went through it, in the long run, I believe it was a better improvement. Most of the businesses that want to relocate to our town want to relocate to this section because they like it, it's walkable, it's uh, bicyclist friendly. Um, I was skeptical with the so-called road diet. As somebody who commutes to work to Albany every day and back, I was concerned the detrimental effect it was going to have on commuters. However, I've looked at the Creighton Manning report. I've looked at the studies that were done. It's estimated that at peak times, the increase in traffic on Delaware Avenue during commuting would be 50 seconds. Um, so that given the case, uh, I am in favor of the project, um, uh, the town board has applied to the state for funding. If the funding comes through, the state will pick up the majority of the tab of it. It is not a program just for bicyclists. It's a program about safety. It's about making kids going to Ellesmere School safer crossing the road. Um, it's about people in the areas near Delaware Avenue being able to walk to restaurants uh, more safer. And it's about reducing the number of accidents of which there have been an inordinate amount of, of, of uh, accidents on that section. It was done on Madison Avenue in Albany, um, and my understanding, and I've driven that section of Madison Avenue, it was a success in Madison Avenue, and I think we can do it here um, and make it so that it's uh, going to, to not inconvenience people with commuting times, but get them to slow down and patronize the, um, the, the businesses that are along that stretch. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. So the road diet, um, first of all, a rather bizarre name. Roads don't usually go on diets. Um, the impact of this, though, is going to be that businesses on that avenue are going to be seeing less traffic, more difficulty getting in and getting out of them. So I spent three days campaigning on Delaware Avenue to see what this traffic was. And I have to tell you, the car traffic was heavy. There were two bikers one morning that rode into work on Delaware Avenue. On a Saturday where we had thousands of cars going to the farmer's market and the St. Thomas blessing of the animals, I saw four families walk down the sidewalk and one biker. Where is this demand that we make this significant a change after we've just redone the road? And I'm gonna to suggest to you that it was appealing to an interest group that would be vocal and demanding. The consequence is that we're going to find ourselves in a position where businesses that are paying two taxes, one for the taxes on their property to maintain their business, and the second for their home taxes, that business has to yield them double the taxation that anyone else would have to deal with as a homeowner. These are significant impacts. In the study that was done for the town, three quarters of a page dealt with the issue of economic impact. I'm going to suggest to you it wasn't a fair analysis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey, rebuttal. Again, my understanding is the majority of businesses that have contacted Town Hall and want to locate here want to locate on the section that's single lane only because they find that preferable. It is not just about how many people currently are biking and walking, but it's about if you make it safer, more people will do it because right now you're kind of taking your life on your hand walking across that section of Delaware Avenue. There was a series of public forums. People were asked to weigh in. The public voted in favor of the road diet. There was a survey by the Chamber of Commerce and the majority of businesses, not all of them, but the majority of businesses along that stretch want this so-called road diet. It's going to be an improvement and uh, at least the majority of businesses along that stretch believe it's going to result in an increase of people 
walking, driving to their businesses on Delaware Avenue. Delaware Avenue is not a freeway. It's not a, it's not, you're not racing to get from one place to another. It's not Central Avenue. It's not Wolf Road. It's the heart of our community. And in order to keep it the heart of our community, I believe that this is a, a fair proposal. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. So I visited with two fire departments in town to ask them their opinions. And they both said to me that they were deeply concerned about the impact of this on fire safety, that they're having trouble now getting in and out of the schools and out of the businesses. And they indicated to me that they felt that this was not a preferable move. Now, it wasn't a survey, but it was an interview. And I'm going to suggest to you that the businesses I spoke to were not supportive of another uh, upgrading of that avenue that's going to disrupt business for a significant period of time. This is costly to us. These events, we want these small businesses here. The businesses coming in are not the majority. It's those that are here trying to make a living and pay their personal property taxes and the tax on their business. That's significant. In one case, the school tax alone for one business out there was $8,000. That means that business has to yield $16,000 in order to pay their school taxes. That's significant. Thank you, sir. With the next question, the next question is directed to Mr. Carriero. With the road diet, excuse me, with the road diet coming and knowing the hardships the businesses felt during the 2017 Delaware Avenue construction, what do you propose to help local businesses survive during the construction? Well, I, I think, first of all, it's time to revisit the issue, that we're not there yet. We didn't get approval, and we could reverse this process. Um, secondly, I think it's time to put them in a room and say, what do you want us to do? How would you deal with this, since it's going to directly infect and affect your ability to pay taxes and generate revenue? Why not have the people that it's going to have the biggest impact on sit in this room and give an opinion? I'll tell you why because we're gonna be afraid to hear what the answer is. They're frightened. They're frightened by the changes that we've made here to our community and the impact it's gonna have on them. This is their family's livelihood. Now, I've participated more and more with them to understand what their needs are. And some of them have gone through a very difficult time, substantial reduction in business through that reconstruction of the road. It was torturous. In one case, a cafe was down 60% and had to, to lay off their staff, and had the woman who owned it had to manage and serve food along with the chef in order to stay in business. That's real hardcore direct impact. I know it's romantic to say that we should have a, a road diet. I'm going to suggest to you there's a safety issue that's not been truly addressed, that our emergency staffs are, have discussed it and have grave concerns as well as the economic impact on the people who do business on that road. Never mind the opinions of the drivers that are going to have to deal with this issue of delay. I go down that road in the morning to go to meetings in Albany on the boards that I serve on. I will tell you, it's a treacherous, difficult process. It's long and tedious. This slowdown is going to amplify the impact to those of us going down Delaware Avenue in a negative way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey? In the short run, no doubt there's going to be some problems, but, with, but we have to look at the bigger picture. We have to look at the longer-term view. Um, yes, it was difficult when this section of Delaware Avenue uh, was improved, but it was improved, and it's going to be improved, and it's a benefit to all of us for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, look at Madison Avenue. Look at the improvements they made, and look at the result. Yes, in the short term, it's going to be a problem. Your question was, how do we handle it better? When I talked to people when Delaware Avenue was constructed, people didn't realize that shops were open. So I think a lot of his communication, a lot of his perception, a lot of his walking up and down the business and talking to them, asking them what they want, and getting the word out there well in advance of any construction, when it's going to happen, how traffic's going to impact it, what alternative roads people can take, and letting them know that businesses are open and that you should patronize them. That's the important thing, is to get out front in the communication to our community to let them know the schedule for construction, 
and um, when, how businesses are going to be affected and, and encourage people as a community to get out and to encourage them to continue to patronize the business and to, so they don't uh, suffer the revenue loss in the short term, but in the long term, they're going to see a benefit to the improvements. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. Mr. Coffey, that logic does not play. Going to people and telling them that we want you to continue to use businesses that are blocked, that are inoperable, that you can't get in and out of easily, as you have backed up traffic in addition to that, is not appropriate. You can't appeal to a group of people to use businesses when it's difficult to get in and out of there as consumers. They're not walking to these businesses now. The, the sidewalks are not being used, yet we feel it necessary to dig them up and start this all over again. This is just torture to this business community, inappropriately so. Now that doesn't mean it's a bad idea and that there's some compromising way we might be able to figure out how to do things. Instead of saying either all diet or no diet, why don't we sit down with those businesses and say, how do we do this so that we both win? That's the logic of speaking to people and getting their participation as opposed to an interest group. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey. Um, to be clear, I'm not asking that we tell people to go patronize businesses that are blocked or, or inoperable. Uh, rather, we need to communicate when businesses are open and accessible to make sure we communicate the schedule for construction, that it be done in phases, and that we let people know that such and such a restaurant or business is open, and here's when it's going to be closed, and that we make sure the construction sticks to the schedule. So uh, again, it's about communicating, yes, you can get there, it's open, and here's the alternative routes. We're not asking you to go to some place that's blocked or inaccessible, but rather it is accessible. And to get over the, the perception some people have, oh my God, it's a mess down in Delaware River, I don't want to go there. We need to make sure that we get out front and let people know uh, that everything's okay and that yes, you can um, drive to certain businesses and patronize them. Thank you, sir. The next question is directed to Mr. Coffey. Town residents have voiced concerns over increased development changing the character of our town. Would you oppose or favor a moratorium on developments pending the adoption of the town's new comprehensive plan? Yes, I would be in favor of a moratorium. Um, a moratorium in order to be legal and so we don't get sued and have it overturned, it has to be reasonable as to length and it has to be reasonable as to what we're going to do a moratorium on. We cannot just do a blanket moratorium. For example, we want more businesses to come into our town. So we want to make sure we carve out a moratorium on multi-unit structures, like what's going on in Slingerlands, what's going on in uh, the old Clanky property, Rockefeller Road, other Wemple uh, Road, all these areas of town. We want to have a carve out moratorium to put a pause on it so we can take a look at the comprehensive plan, update the zoning laws, set up an open space preservation fund so that when the moratorium ends, we will be able to go in and buy up property rights and preserve some of that property. So yes, I am in favor of a moratorium, but it's got to be a targeted moratorium so we're not telling the business community that Bethlehem isn't open. We got to make sure that we continue to welcome businesses, but that we do something about the multi-family townhouses, apartment buildings, and all the other developments. If a single family home wants to go in, certainly that's acceptable. But if somebody wants to cram 40 or 50 single family homes in, I would be in favor of a short-term moratorium while we, we hit the pause button and take a look at the bigger issues affecting our town. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. I would respectfully disagree. I think a moratorium is going to build up more pressure and more demand for construction once it's over. We've been through this rain dance before. This is not the first time. The, the reality is that we are so backed up with requests for development right now that our infrastructure can't support it. It's going to strain our school system. It's going to strain our roads. It's going to increase traffic. It's dramatic. Why did this happen? Because the management of this town chose to open up the spigot by over taxation and then having the ability and wanting the ability to provide more services so that it could increase overhead. This is not a prudent method to deal with the reality of the situation. We are in a growth mode because the people leading this community put us in that predicament. That is the danger. 
to allow us to believe that another comprehensive plan, which I do favor, is going to prevent the same mistakes is not appropriate. We had an opportunity in that last comprehensive plan. 20 years ago, we were talking about plans. Here are documents from 15 years ago when our new government came in that said all the same things we're talking about today and they're not resolved. So stopping development doesn't make sense. Maybe what we should have done is having proper zoning enforcement and stop giving out the ability to vacate those rules. Maybe that legally would have been the proper way to say these are the rules for zoning, you can't do this. We didn't do that. We've allowed this construction and these things not to be fulfilled by the fact that we're saying to people, we're gonna make allowances for your position or the construction of your facility against the zoning laws. That's why it's called the Zoning Board of Appeals. So consequently, those exceptions have only made the situation more complicated and allowed for Thank you, development. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey. Um, again, the question was about moratorium. Um, a moratorium is not going to solve problems in the long run, but I do believe it's good in the short term uh, to hit the pause button so we could take a look um, and try to stop some of the developments that are going on right now. I've looked at the number of building permits. They are not up dramatically. There has not been some kind of sudden surge. And in fact, after the 2008 uh, financial collapse, there was actually a decline in new projects coming in. There's much we can do on open space if we can leverage state money. If we can come up with 25%, the state can match a 75% and we can buy up property rights where the town does not have to be the titled owner of the property and be stuck with maintaining it, but you can pay a farmer or someone else who has open space to keep that, that space open. I agree with, with uh, Jim that we need to look at the zoning laws. That would be part of the comprehensive plan. We have, I believe, 16 different zoning districts. As, Characters of neighborhoods change. You need to take a look at your zoning laws. You need to update them. The uh, comprehensive plan talks about an open space fund. Thank it you, hasn't sir. been done. We need to meet the goals Time. of the comp plan. Mr. Carriero. So let's talk about conservation. Um, clearly, if you travel this town and see the extreme growth that's going on, it contradicts the information you're giving us. I am astounded at campaigning and street after street and seeing for sale signs and construction going on. I'm sorry, something extraordinary is happening here. We're losing our town. This cycle of boom and bust is not in our experience. We're having boom after boom. That's a real issue. Talking about conservation though, means you need to put some teeth into it. And that previous conservation plan supposedly was supposed to do that. Why didn't it do it? Because the people that are interpreting the plan really wanted development. And the consequence of that is the overdevelopment that we're experiencing. Now, there are other ways to fund conservation. Borrowing money and then paying debt on it is not a great idea. Thank you, sir. All right, the next question is directed to Mr. Carriero. The Route 9W corridor was addressed as a focal point in the previous comprehensive plan. What issues do you see with the current state around Walmart and Price Chopper in Glenmont? Well, the issue really is it's almost impossible to get there. So whatever planning we do, we have to accept the fact that the volume of traffic there is not just Bethlehem residents. Um, 44,000 cars a day and trucks are going one way up 9W. I've stood out there now for seven mornings waving to people. I know it's a little silly, but I got a lot of attention. And I will tell you, I've had trucks almost blow me off the road, cars speeding by at incredible speeds. The intensity of it is unbelievable. I'm not opposed to a traffic methodology that might slow that down some by having the roundabout. But I'm telling you, there are serious problems with the roundabout. And the people that have brought it up in Glenmont at the, um, the school this summer talked about the fact, would children be able to cross that road with a bicycle? There's no way. Would bikers be able to go into a roundabout? There's, it would be highly dangerous. Knowing the size of the trucks coming out of Lafarge and the depth of them, it's shocking to believe they're gonna be able to make a roundabout that would be able to deal with that issue. 
I'm not really sure there's a solution when you have the largest employers in the capital region down the road called the state. We are blessed to have Albany Med, the state of New York, and St. Peter's here. But the consequence of that is 9W traffic is not just ours. It's Schoharie County, it's Greene County, and it's Bethlehem. And it is intense. The solution probably is that we have to start to defer some of the truck traffic off of some of those, those streets and bring them over to the street uh, Corning Hill that it was pre uh, prepared for. Truck traffic should not be allowed to be going down Glenmont Road. This is serious in that the size of this equipment and the nature of it is substantial. Time, thank you. Mr. Coffey. Um, I agree with Jim that the traffic on 9W has, um, um, has become unwieldy. We need to do something about it. Um, it's grown substantially. I don't even know if it's feasible to expand the road, but it just seems like given the level of traffic, you almost need to add a lane uh, to it. Um, the roundabout, I've heard a lot of people in Glenmont are not happy about the roundabout. They have the concerns about walkability. Um, I know the ones, uh, roundabouts that went in up, uh, up uh, north uh, in Slingerlands in 85 uh, seem to move traffic better. It takes a while for people to learn how to do, manage the roundabout, but once you learn it, generally the roundabout gets traffic to move uh, smoother. I understand that the issues with walkability have been raised for the planning board. And I understand that they've addressed them and that they've assured that um, the, when the roundabout goes in, they're going to have it appropriately laned. Um, so that people can walk through it. Um, I agree that we need to uh, redirect some of the truck traffic. I talked about the Selkirk bypass. There may be some way that we can take some of that truck traffic off of 9W and divert it. Uh, although some of the businesses like Walmart, they're going to need to get trucks, but perhaps we can talk to them about doing it at, um, at non-peak times. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero, do you have a rebuttal? Well, again, I think it's one of those very difficult issues that we're facing. More growth in our town is going to develop more traffic on these roads. So it, it's going to have to come back to how do we deal with growth? The strategy that was in place for the past 15 years was allow growth and allow significant growth um, to the point where the, 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 the planning process did not stop the reality of um, what was going to happen in a town that has a lot of assets called land. What we have now, though, is we're at a crossroads where we have to figure out how do we maintain this? How do we maintain the setting that we all came here for? I didn't need a town survey to tell me that I love the country. I didn't need a town survey to tell me there was too much traffic. What I needed was people coming up with resolutions. They've had 15 years. It's not getting better. Why would we want to trust this organization and this structure to continue right. on? Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey. Um, I've looked at the data, and I, I respectfully disagree that uh, while we do have concerns with growth, I don't think it's been uh, out of control as, as Mr. Carriero suggests. Yes, we do have stresses from development. It has to be managed. I understand we have excess water capacity, for example, right now. We're not stressed on our infrastructure with the amount of growth that we've, that we've, uh, that we've had coming in. Um, that having been said, we do need to do more to implement. If you go back and look at the comprehensive plan, a lot of the goals have been realized. A lot of them have not. So we need to go back and revisit that and do things, the number one thing being have an open space preservation fund. Um, but uh, um, in terms of 9W, um, I think we need to look at the feasibility. And you have to gather data. You have to do studies in order to make policy decisions. So you first go out and you measure traffic, you gather the data, then you decide whether it's feasible um, to slow traffic, to have more um, lanes added, or do something to deal or divert uh, truck traffic off of 9W. Thank you, sir. The next question is directed to Mr. Coffey. The up to 2% real estate transfer tax to fund open space preservation is no longer under consideration. What were your thoughts or concerns about the prior plan that was presented to the state legislature? And would you favor asking state representatives to reintroduce the bill to establish a real estate transfer tax? Well, as Vindicate, we need an open space preservation fund. I, I, I do believe that um, the transfer tax is dead. 
uh, for those of you who um, aren't aware of the backstory of it, um, there was a um, bill that passed the assembly which would have given the town of Bethlehem the authority, if it so choose, to have a townwide vote as to whether we would have a transfer tax up to 2%. The bill died. It died in two th 2017. Supervisor Van Leuven has said repeatedly he is not asking for it. Elected officials, Assemblywoman Fahey, Senator Breslin, have indicated uh, that the bill is dead. So no, I would not support introducing this bill at this time. We do not have support for the bill. I would never support passing a bill, even through one house of uh, a state assembly, unless there's public support for it. I think we put the cart before the horse. I think we should have had a series of public hearings. We should have asked for public input. We should have decided a variety of methods for funding open space. And only after we went through that process should we've decided on a funding method. One method is the transfer tax. One method is have the developers pay. Right now, developers have to pay into what's called a parkland set-aside. Perhaps we could repurpose parkland set-aside to have that go to open space, which is what Clifton Park does. The other alternative is have everybody's property taxes go up to pay for open space, and I'm not sure people want to do that. So I think the first step is to have public hearings, get the uh, grassroots support, get the people to come out, have that conversation, and then only if the people want it, would you move forward with any kind of legislation um, to set up an open space fund? But we're not there yet, and I would not support reintroducing this transfer tax bill. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. Can I have an hour for this response? <laughs> um, let's, let's put the record straight here. Before I went to the town and said, under the Freedom of Information Act, in August, who submitted this bill to the legislature? I was refused. You, you, it's a privilege between government agencies to speak to each other, and they would not give me any information. I then appeared before the town board, and I said to them in the open mic session, where it's a rather bizarre experience, but you can talk to them, but they don't speak to you. And I said to them, tell me, would you please go to the legislature and withdraw these two bills? This is September. And the answer was blanks. Then I said, here's the data where you've refused to give me an answer. Why don't you just go to the legislature, both houses, and withdraw the bill? No answer. Then I said, would you take a position as a board and say you were opposed to the tax so that we all feel better? And I'll take this off the table. I will take it off the table, and I'll talk about water and traffic and all the other issues I see. They refused to do it. Two weeks later, Jim Foster brings it to the board. It's brought up, and a heated debate goes on. Bottom line, they would not issue the letters to the legislature. So let's be clear. August I asked. September I went and begged. And Jim finally brings it to the board, and they would not vote to ask for the legislation to be withdrawn. I ask you, if we had not done that, where would we be today? There's a third step. We have a public meeting two weeks ago. Guess what happened? Then at that point, our supervisor admits that it wasn't he, but it was the previous supervisor who did go to the legislature and ask for this. Now I ask you, if this is open government, what would closed government look like? I mean, this is peculiar. So I'm just Jim from 26 Somerset Drive. You can't answer simple I'm, questions? Thank you, sir. How about the hour? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Coffey. As I've said before, the, the, the uh, so-called transfer tax was, was mishandled. It's not the way I would uh, advocate handing for it. You should never introduce legislation uh, without having public input. Um, Supervisor Van Leuven has said he had nothing to do with it, and I, I take him at his word on that. Um, the bill was introduced. Um, uh, uh, by Assemblywoman Fahey, it passed, it died in 2017, so it's my understanding there's nothing to withdraw because the bill is dead, it's dead, it's buried, there's dirt on top of it. Um, I just don't want this issue to cloud the bigger issue is we need an open space fund and we need a method for paying for it. And I do think there's been a little bit of distraction. I was at the forum on October 11th that Jim participated in. There was a real estate lobbyist, there were a couple uh, realtors there, and it was all, we hate the transfer tax, and that's not the kind of form I want. I want a fair and balanced form where all viewpoints are allowed, not just one viewpoint, but we hear from everybody, and we can have Fine. that conversation. You, and only when we have consensus, we can move forward. All right. 
Mr. Carriero. So, the forum, public was invited. You know, you talked about having those public meetings where you invite people, we did that. Um, an interesting development